any ETA on him? Uh, I haven't seen anything or heard anything. We shouldn't, um, we shouldn't start to go live until he's in the okay. room and ready to go. Okay, so, but we're not live right now. Um, I'm live on Facebook, just pushing the graphic. Okay. Um, but I won't switch to you guys until. Hey, Paula. Oh, yes. Good. How are you doing today? Hi, this is our office now. Okay, perfect. Forty-five minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'll definitely make that work, and we'll. Uh, um, you know, this will do. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you very much. Bye. All right. Okay, sorry. Uh, I guess it's maybe you could hear. He's about to log on now. Oh, sorry, James. Yes. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, so when he logs on, um, I guess when when do I start doing the action? I'm sure you may have just uh, mentioned this, but when do I start doing the hi? How are you? Thanks everyone okay. for being here. Um, if you want to shoot the breeze a little bit with him, um, you know, before we officially begin, that's totally fine. No, 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 no. I mean, like, how do I know when I start telling folks hi? How are you? Thank you for joining us. You know, all that stuff. Basically. Um, You'll let me know we're going to go live in 10 seconds when you feel ready, just whenever okay. you feel ready at your discretion. Um, by, the, by the time you've counted down to 10 uh, in, in your head, um, I will already be pushing you guys live. So okay. just at your discretion at that point. Sounds good. All right. And first of all, and with that said, thanks everyone who's uh, joined us, who is on the Zoom call. Um, I just uh, was on the phone with the public advocate's office. So they'll be joining us in a, uh, in a split second. And then once that happens, uh, James, who you may have heard, is going to um, start on um, broadcasting this uh, live with Facebook. So, um, um, so yeah, so just uh, give us a quick minute and we will begin starting. Thank you. And of course, thanks everyone for saying you can see me now. <laughs> Hey, uh, James, I see someone who looks like he's logged in as uh, Jumani Williams. Can you, um, I guess, check to make sure that his uh, camera comes up? Uh, I can take a look. Hi. I think that's, yeah, and they're calling now. I, yes, hello? Sure. Okay, yeah, I see him right now. I think he's supposed to be in as a panelist. Um, Let's see, James, do you know how to then make the um, um, public advocate a panelist now? I think I would need host privileges to be able to do that. Um, okay. So if you want to just pass host privileges to me momentarily, I can, I can try and tackle that. Okay. All right. So I'm going to see if I can uh, take care of this. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right. Let's see. So privileges. And where would I find? Uh, so if you click on participants, um, under panelists, you'll see my name and your name. Um, right. And then under more, there's probably gonna be an option to say make make host or something. Got it. Got it. Cool. All right. Uh, I'll make you co-host. Perfect. So we'll, and right. then I should probably be able to do this now. All right. Great. I'm co-host now. Uh, promotes panelists. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pass host privileges back over to you now. Perfect. Great. Hello. How are you doing, public advocate? Peace and blessings. I'm working on being okay. How about you? Not bad, not bad. You know, it's funny. I've, I've been telling folks, you know, when you say that, 
You know, it used to be such an innocuous thing to say to start with, but now it's such a loaded question when you ask how yeah. somebody is doing right now. For so, sure, that's right. Yeah, great. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, let's see, I guess, you know, we should probably just jump into it because I know you have a very uh, heavy schedule. We may have to sure. uh, uh, end uh, a couple of minutes early. Um, but James, I guess with that said, can you just uh, start the uh, broadcast? So I guess we'll get started in uh, 10 seconds. Sure, no problem. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, uh, with that said, um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us um, for um, uh, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, our fireside chat with uh, Jumani Williams, who is the public advocate for the city of New York. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about 21st century uh, activism and uh, police reform. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, MBBA, we're the largest association of predominantly um, black attorneys in New York. Our goal includes uh, advancing equality in the pursuit of justice, uh, assisting in the professional development of our members, and addressing legal issues affecting New Yorkers. Today, we are happy to have New York City public advocate Jumani Williams with us. Um, prior to becoming the public advocate, Jumani served on the New York City Council representing the 45th District. Jumani is a first-generation Brooklynite of Grenadian heritage. He graduated from public school, overcoming the difficulties of Tourette's and ADHD to earn a master's degree from Brooklyn College. He began his career as a community organizer at the Greater Flatbush Beacon School and later served as the executive director of the New York State Tenants and Neighbors. And there he fought for truly affordable, income-targeted housing across New York City and New York City State. In the city council, Jumani championed landmark legislation that fundamentally transformed policing in New York. He sponsored the Community Safety Act, reforming the city's po um, police department, by ending the abuse of stop, question, and address in communities of color, and creating the NYPD's Office of Inspector General to investigate unlawful and unethical behavior. Jumani has led the fight for better policing and safer streets, affordable housing, and transparency and accountability in city government. And as public advocate, uh, Jumani continues to be an activist elected official bringing the voices of everyday New Yorkers to city government and making New York a truly progressive uh, beacon for us all. So with that said, uh, thank you very much uh, again for, uh, for joining us, Jamani. Oh, thanks for having, uh, for having me and reading that awesome bio that I, I probably wrote. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I definitely, uh, one day I'm thinking, man, I need, I need a bio like that. You know, I got to get to it. <laughs> So um, I think most folks uh, may be familiar with the Public Advocate's Office, but just to you know, kind of get things uh, situated, can you let folks who may not know exactly what the Public Advocate does and then maybe a couple of uh, the issues that you're uh, currently uh, focusing on? Sure, um, you know, I would say I'm, I'm of the opinion that most folks don't know uh, what the Public Advocate Office is. Um, so there are uh, three citywide elected officials uh, four, if you include the Speaker of the City Council, it's the Mayor, uh, myself, the Public Advocate, and lastly, uh, the Comptroller of the City of New York. Um, for people who do know, they usually think of the Public Advocate as, you know, something happened to the Mayor or he resigned, uh, I would take uh, the position until a special election was called. Uh, but the Charter does put in uh, some um, direct and specific things that the Public Advocate does. We can introduce legislation. Uh, in the city council, uh, just had one uh, pass today. Actually, uh, we're primarily an ombudsman uh, for the city, go between between the city and the people and and government. Um, we can uh, we have a charter cop to make sure that the sorry the offices and administration and uh, agencies are doing the work that they're supposed to be doing that the charter uh, says they can do. We have a vote on the pension board, and we can. Uh, Give, uh, point people to commissions like uh, city planning, like um, CCRB. Uh, but most of all, I think it's a very good bully pulpit to uh, bring up issues that may not otherwise be lifted up. Uh, great, great, great. Yeah, so, uh, and, and it's such an important office. Uh, you know, sometimes folks don't know. I mean, if you want to have like an ombudsman who's going to be looking at all the city agencies, I mean, this is exactly what the public advocate's office is there to do. 
And uh, you know, there's so many ways it could be responsive to making sure that our city agencies are doing what they're um, um, doing, what they've been uh, tasked with doing. So yeah, and, um, uh, people may not know, you know, what the public advocate does, but the last two public advocates people who are generally familiar with, uh, Tish James, who is now the uh, the attorney general of the state, right. and uh, our mayor, Bill De Blasio, was right, the right, advocate. exactly, and especially Tish James. Um, outside of this. Uh, uh, I work at the attorney general's office. So, uh, 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 thank you for, uh, you know, for my boss <laughs> and thanks for uh, keeping up uh, the same type of uh, good work. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that seems so great about this time is there's so much more activism and it's a unique type of active activism. Uh, cause I know for me, I mean, I've, I've been around and, you know, from the days of Amadou Diallo, you know, then, you know, earlier on when we're talking about Sean Bell or Eric Garner and out in uh, Sterling, and then now, you know, George Floyd and this most recent, you know, you know, uh, number of, uh, of deaths. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, as someone who's been an activist uh, for so long, why you think activism today is so different than it may, or it may be being so much more effective than it has been in the past? Um, I'm not sure that activism is different. I think that the time is very unique and there's a lot more people out in the streets and people are attuned to respond, which is just amazing. Uh, I think that's, there's many reasons for that. Um, you know, obviously the, uh, the bigot in chief in the White House uh, is there, uh, kind of always stirring up feelings. But we just got over, oh, I'm sorry, we're not over. We've just gone through three months of a global pandemic uh, and we're not finished yet. And people were home and sitting home and while every community has dealt with some issues and we lift up their stories, it's clear the black and brown communities were disproportionately affected uh, by that pandemic and they saw their friends and families disproportionately lose jobs or die around them. Uh, and then you came out and you saw same communities um, being uh, enforced by police uh, when it came to social distancing in a very disproportionate way. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you had Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Amy Cooper calling down state police on Christian Cooper. And so I think there's a unique time period that's happening where it's just, you, you, you have to be, you know, someone who is just like, like we see blindly following Donald Trump, oblivious to, the, to what's in front of them, but everybody else can plainly see um, the, the dichotomy that exists in our state, our city and our country uh, that's based on privilege and very often based on race in a way that's just hard to ignore. That's why across this country and actually across the globe, people are saying Black Lives Matter in a way that they haven't uh, in this lifetime. I don't even think uh, in any lifetime, to be honest. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely feel the same way. I mean, that's why it just seems like, you know, we're really maybe at a, um, you know, an inflection point where hopefully we'll really be able to see some of these changes that, you know, folks have been advocating for for so long. Um, you know, one of the things I definitely think about as we see this activism now and how it has, you know, started to show some uh, uh, effectiveness, you know, what are some of the ways that maybe we can learn from this movement and be able to apply it to other types of movement, whether we're talking about housing, whether we're talking about, you know, family issues, whether we're talking about, you know, all these economic injustices that we also see out there that need to be um, remedied. You know, I'm concerned that you know, in a few months, we'll have collective amnesia uh, about all the things that happened. We've seen that happen before. And you point out the effectiveness. And, uh, you know, it's also, you always have to, you know, celebrate things that are happening while understanding that we're far from where we need to be. And, you know, usually that's, we always say that, but that, that this time in particular, that, that means a lot because we're caught with having to thank people for doing the things that they were blocking for so many years. Um, and we're thanking people for the absolute low-hanging fruit. We're basically saying, thank you for putting a law in saying that you can't choke people to death or that you can't uh, actually see the, dis uh, discre the um, disciplinary records of municipal employees. And that's low-hanging fruit. And the reason legislatures, including city council and the state legislature, were able to move so fast because people have been working on these bills for a very long time. They were ready to go. We just didn't have the political courage, the will, uh, to get it passed, and that includes the governor and the mayor. So yes, I'm thankful that those things have gotten done, uh, but those are old. And so we wanna see uh, a real push 
uh, when we talk about divest, defund the police or reinvest, all those words mean the same thing to me. In New York City, we need a billion dollars to start with from the police department. We do need to get um, police out of schools. Most importantly, we have to have a very real discussion about what public safety means and what it doesn't mean. And understanding the interplay of all the things you mentioned, housing, uh, health access to mental health and health, uh, and access to safe, and for, I'm sorry, to quality schools, safe schools as well, access to healthy education, and um, sorry, healthy foods, and jobs to pay for that. And when we deal with those things, public safety starts to look a lot different. So I know we're focused very much on the police at this point in time, but all those issues exist in every institution in this city and the state, and we have to also get to address those. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And actually, just as a, a quick house, uh, housekeeping point, uh, for folks who may want to ask questions, feel free to just uh, throw them in the Q and A, and I'll also try to see if I um, if I see some in the chat as we're talking as well. Um, actually, um, uh, so two questions I see here that maybe want to just get to quickly. Um, one is, uh, let's see, can the PA assist churches with the improper or illegal property taxes levied against them by the city department of finance? Uh, what we can do is help navigate um, what, what's happening there. So I invite everybody to uh, reach out to our constituency service, um, uh, constituency service unit. We've been up and running, uh, telecommuting primarily, uh, but very, very responsive from Monday to Friday. So you can always uh, text, get help, I'm sorry, email, get help at advocate.nyc.gov, get help at advocate.nyc.gov. You can also go to uh, the Office of Public Advocate um, and all the information how to reach us is there, uh, including the email. It's advocate.nyc.gov. And we have a new texting where you can text to try to get information. Uh, and that's 833-933-1NYC, 833-933-1692. We just launched it, so uh, we're still working some stuff out, but uh, we want to get the three digit number but um, it's actually very expensive. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and then actually a second question that's kind of a more on um, point with what we were just discussing. Um, so Earl uh, Antonio Wilson asks, um, do you see this progressive process ending with another election cycle where new officials will reverse some of the progress? Which actually sounds like a perfect question to ask given that we just had um, um, you know, an election here in, in New York uh, just yesterday. Uh, I think it was, very good night and for I mean we have to we have to count the paper ballots but uh, for folks like me it was a very good night uh, this past Tuesday it's always a danger you know we see ebbs and flow of these things and so we have to stay focused uh, and moving in the right direction we also can't elect people and then walk away we did that uh, with President Obama and kind of just walked away and so we have to stay engaged we have to stay in the streets I believe we have to stay uh, voting uh, we have to fill out our census, and I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but these are things uh, that we absolutely have to do, and they can be eroded. We've seen the erosion of a lot of things, um, uh, and we've seen backlash. And whenever this country has tried to address some of these things, we see the backlash. Even right after, you know, when slavery, when Reconstruction occurred, we had um, great things happening. We had Black senators, Black people in office, and businesses uh, starting to bloom in areas. And the backlash for that was the rise of the KKK and uh, Jim Crow and all those things. And we've seen a backlash for electing the first black president of the United States of America in the form of Donald Trump and the Republicans who are supporting all this bigotry. So we do have to be mindful of what the backlash would be. This one, I will say, it just feels a little different. It feels like the country may be for the first time really trying to atone and address and, and re recognize and acknowledge that there's impact to enslaving an entire race of people that reverberates even until 2020. But that remains to be seen. I mean, one of the cultural shifts that I thought, whoa, this something might be happening and people kind of lessened what I was saying. But when I saw NASCAR say they were no longer yeah. flying the, the Confederate flag, that was a signal to me that it's, this actually something might be different here. You see Mrs. Butterworth and Aunt Jemima, which all seem like small things, but together they do help change the culture of what is acceptable. You know, I think it was 1965 when we had the Civil Rights Act. Um, 
but changing the laws by itself doesn't address what it is that we're trying to address. We do need cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so pivoting back for a second of regards to some of the uh, uh, new legislation that was um, passed regarding police reforms. Uh, you know, there is a whole slate of different um, reforms that were uh, enacted. Um, are there, is there one or two that you think will be uh, especially effective in being able to uh, reduce and hopefully one day eliminate, you know, some of this um, um, police misconduct that we've seen for so many times, uh, for, so, for too long in our community? Anything that has to do with transparency and accountability would help that. That's why the 50A discussion was important. That's why the right to accord, which uh, was passed in the state um, and strengthened in the city, that was a bill I passed as well, make sure folks understand they have an affirmative right to be to take the police as long as they're not interfering with police action. <laughs> All of those things are helpful. The qualified, immu a qualified immunity is in the federal government is extremely important. Uh, it's struggling, but it's very important. But you know, I want to remind folks that, again, those things by themselves are important, but don't get us to the finish line. Minnesota, where George Floyd was killed, actually had many of the reforms that we're asking for now in their police department and he was still killed. And so uh, we do need a lot. Now, some of the officers were arrested because one of the reforms is one that I hope happens here and across the country, which is police officers have to invo get involved. If they see something that's going on uh, awry, they have to get involved. And those officers are responsible for it. We saw that in Eric Garner, officers standing around, not even trying to provide medical assistance, not jumping in to say when there's a problem. <laughs> Thankfully, in the last choke a video we've seen recently in New York City, someone did get involved. But I want to lift up Carol Horn in Buffalo many years ago. She was fired for stopping someone uh, from abusing a, a, uh, a resident, and she was fired. That officer was subsequently fired for abusing someone else, uh, but she was one year from getting her, um, getting her pension. And so she's been fighting for that for maybe about 10 years or so now. And I want to point out that that's a black mayor, Mayor Byron Brown, and it's a black police chief. And so uh, many of these things transcend uh, the normal things we think about, Democrat, Republican, because a lot of these things happened and happen under Democratic leadership. Right. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, I, I know that there are a couple of other things that, uh, you know, I'm expecting you're going to have to get to um, later on. So I know we're going to have to... Um, and probably like around the 645 mark. So I just want to make sure that some of these questions that are coming in um, that we get to as well. Um, but one question that came in and we wanted to hear a little bit more is, you know, we're hearing a lot about this, uh, this concept of like defunding the police. Mm -hmm. And some people, you know, some people think that may, what that means is just defunding, you know, all police. Other folks think that that's, you know, about reallocating certain funds. Like when you talk about that, and, and uh, advocate for uh, you know, issues such as that, what do you think is an effective way of making, you know, a, a essentially defunding the police? Yeah, you know, I th think there's, you know, you have the abolish the police, you have uh, people who think uh, all difference on the spectrum, um, but I don't think we should divide ourselves at the moment. We'll have time to do that in the future. I think right now, the point where everybody's converging, whether it's defund the police, divest, reinvest, abolish, everybody is converging and saying right now, uh, police departments have too much money. Uh, and right here in New York City, that includes the almost $6 billion that the NYPD have, doesn't include the police foundation. <laughs> and we have to take some of that, literally in here in New York, we're asking for a billion dollars, and repurpose <laughs> and to address all the issues that are going on in these communities. Most of them, we send police in to try to deal with as opposed to dealing with those issues. And we know what public safety looks at. So that's the focus. Right? And I think that's where we can all agree right now. Let's worry about some of the other stuff uh, later, but let's keep, continue to push uh, the city council and to hold the mayor's feet to the fire on this. And even uh, the state, you know, there are things that we can do and we should focus on that. So that's what I mean when I say defund the police. Take some of that money that is just too bloated to begin with. Let's start reimagining what public safety means, what it is, and let's fund it appropriately. Right. Yeah, and that actually kind of goes to one of the questions that was um, posed, uh, and it kind of even pivots back even in some ways a little bit to what you're talking about when it comes to school safety with um, police officers. So 
uh, one of our uh, attendees today asked, you know, how can we translate the political momentum of Black Lives Matter and police reform into desegregating some of uh, New York City's public school system? Uh, some of that has to do with uh, getting the right leaders in there. So you have to come out and vote. And, and then pushing them to have the political will to make the changes that are necessary. While understanding, and we can't ignore this, although it is frustrating, sometimes the most well-intentioned of people who support a lot of things when it comes to actually putting into place and it affects them, things get a little different. Right? So we have people who want to support desegregating. Uh, but what we saw on the Upper West Side is that meant except for their school or where their child is going. Right? And so we have to make sure when we talked about gifted and talented stuff that we were, we were saying, look, we have to change how the gifted and talented program works, uh, but we have to do it in a way that we can tell everybody, your child will get what they need uh, for the additional services, the, um, the additional uh, scholastic support that they need as well. What we're trying to do is level the playing field. But we have to intentionally remember and have those discussions because sometimes we just want to make it happen and forgetting that people generally just, while they want a better world, they want to make sure that their child and their family is taken care of. So I think we want to have those conversations while understanding that, but full speed ahead pushing forward. And we have to elect people who are going to courageously um, do it. And if they don't, we got to hit the streets. Right, yeah. And actually, uh, you know, one question that I think really resonates with uh, our organization. So again, you know, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, the largest association of uh, predominantly black attorneys, actually, frankly, not just in New York, but really in the tri-state region. You know, how can minority attorneys, uh, such as uh, uh, the folks here at the MBBA, be able to actively assist in affecting some of the change that you know, we all need, know that we need? Well, first, you know, I'm pretty sure my fiance, India Sneed, is a member of MBBA, so I want to yes, make yes. sure. <laughs> Yeah, if you um, play a strong role in being able to make sure this happens too. <laughs> yeah. uh, Thank you, but, you, know, you know, it law is very important. And so there's a ton of ways that people can get involved <clears throat> from just reaching out to organizations that are working on these issues and very often can't afford the type of legal assistance that they need or the legal minds to work through this. Now, very often people have trouble understanding how to get that fire from the streets and get it changed into an actual law or policy change. So providing those services to those communities are incredibly helpful, uh, helping them translate the energy we spoke about. Um, having providing um, your services when uh, there are protests and people outside, just being out there when people need attorneys to try to figure out how to navigate a situation or even after they've gotten arrested. Uh, so there's de definitely many avenues where people can use legal assistance and legal help, uh, particularly in these type of discussions, because very often, as you know, the people uh, who are hurting the most often have uh, the least resources. Right, yeah, totally agree. And uh, I, I feel compelled uh, to say that, you know, some of the things that we've been doing recently is, you know, we put together a judicial training academy so that more folks who are coming from our ranks will be in, um, uh, positions to become judges to be able to affect the you know the system in that sense. Uh, we've been doing work when it comes, for example, to Civil Rights Law 50A. You know, we've been advocating for that uh, change for a couple of years, and you know, I've been talking about some of those challenges. You know, even you know last month or early this month about it before things um, happen. Um, so we're definitely looking at that. But you know, I, I would also say, yeah, uh, make sure you focus on the DAs as well. We always leave the DAs out of this conversation even have they have probably the most tremendous ability uh, to enforce, not enforce, prosecute, not, and not prosecute. And then lastly, something I just always tell folks, you know, go to your community board meetings, go to your police precinct council meetings. So much is done on a local level that you can affect and assist communities who are trying to figure out how to navigate the system, who are going to these places themselves and may not be given the proper information uh, as they're asking for assistance. Having people there um, who are attorneys or other type of professionals helping communities uh, is extremely important and helpful as well. Right, right. definitely. Um, so another question that uh, came in, uh, and this is um, pretty interesting. So um, Burlett uh, wonders, you know, 
we also have um, certain folks who do uh, who may you know just you know who may violate the law. And uh, what um, Burlett's question is is that there what do we do to make sure that you know when someone is fearful when they call nine one one. Um, that is going to have the same type of efficacy as before, because it seems like the concern would be that, uh, you know, police officers may be second guessing themselves or maybe, I guess, as you say, too cautious to ask. So, you know, what what are your thoughts on uh, on that issue? So uh, just to be clear, she, she's not talking about someone violating the law for civil disobedience or social justice issue. You're talking about someone who's violating the law and is um, is it somehow harming public safety or the social good, I guess, is what we're saying? Right, or, or let's say you're in your home and you think that maybe someone is uh, breaking in and you call 911 and you're hoping that the police will come to be able to help you. Or even firecrackers going off when you can't, uh, you can't sleep. Um, what I would say is that we have to begin again to reassess what public safety is. And what we have been taught to do for far too long is to equate public safety with policing. And so we call police for everything. Uh, we'll call police for someone breaking into your home. Uh, we call police for someone with the firecrackers. We call police for a broken window. Uh, so we have to just reassess what we're doing. And we don't have to call police for everything. The primary responses that police are called for are nonviolent responses. And so we should have an entirely different system for that. Why are police responding to mental health calls? That shouldn't be the first folks that we reach out to. If someone is breaking into your, ho your house right at this moment in time, at two o'clock in the morning, I mean, you may want to call the police. I, I can't make much argument. Uh, but firecrackers, we may, know, we may want to reassess and make sure that if we have to engage law enforcement, that they're focused on the supply and distribution. Who's bringing these things in? not necessarily the people on the ground who are using it. Let's leave that for another group of folks. Maybe the fire department can do some education. Maybe the community groups that are on the ground can go in and have conversations and deal with the young people so that it's not a law enforcement mechanism. With, when it comes to gun violence, we've realized that uh, cure violence and violence interrupters uh, do, can do a much better job than a simple arresting and summonsing and you know, we have to give these communities more options than violence uh, or jail, which is very often the two options that they have or both. And that takes some reimagining and some courage to, to move forward. And so if someone needs assistance, you know, you, you should call together, particularly if it's acute assistance. But what we've been doing is for far too long, we've been providing acute solutions for a complex problem. And so that's if we pretend had an injury to our hand or shoulder, or you're hurt and you only get to triage in the hospital. You never get to go to the back room where they have fancy machines and interdisciplinary medical doctors who can look at it and figure out what the issue is. You know, our communities have been in triage for many, many years. Right. And one thing that you had mentioned a little earlier has to do with essentially police officers being in our schools and looking at ways that there may be reforms there. Could you tease that out a little bit more? Yeah, I, I do believe that we have to get police out of our school. Uh, I think there's a general consensus among people who are pushing for that. Uh, there seems to be a split on whether we're going to fire everybody all at once or we're going to find a way to transition folks. And I, I lean toward the second. Um, but I do believe um, we can't have the NYPD in these schools. Um, it's a little different than some of the places I've been communicating with that actually have armed police officers in the school. But we do have uh, people who are effectively work for the police department who can summons and who can arrest. And again, we have to just reimagine what that looks like. Uh, we have to reimagine who do we need? Do we really need NYPD in charge of discipline in these schools? Uh, my answer would be probably not. Um, we can find other ways to do this. There are restorative justice models that can do this. We are having police in schools while we're getting rid of guidance counselors Right now, guidance classes in a program that was sent uh, to the schools who needed it the most. And so let's find a way to repurpose and transition uh, those folks out uh, of the NYPD and out of the schools unless we're going to re-envision who, what they are, I mean, what they do and what their job title is. At the same time, we want to remember that very often when, you know, the ax comes, the people who get it look the same. So 
many of these folks are black and brown and many of them are actually black women. And we want to make sure that uh, this, that is also a part of the conversation. Great. And by the way, definitely keep the, the questions uh, coming. Because uh, again, you know, we'll probably have a, another uh, 10 minutes um, with the um, public advocate. Uh, one question that, that's come in from Elizabeth is when you talk about reinvesting the NYPD budget into communities, what kind of community-centered and city-sponsored organizations do you imagine we can create to fill this gap? I mean, there's a bunch right now. We're just talking about community groups. The Mayor's Office of uh, Criminal Justice has uh, the Mayor's Action Plan. They have uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety. We have Mayor's Office of uh, Gun Violence Prevention. All of them work with groups on the ground right now who are dedicated to addressing violence in a holistic way. Um, you know, when we dealt with the abuse of stop question frisk, one of the things I'm most proud of, although people usually associate the stop and frisk work, is helping shepherd in a pilot program of $5 million uh, to deal with gun violence by using a multi-pronged approach, using cure violence, violence interrupters, and wraparound services. And we've seen it work in communities. And we can grow that. Uh, we can grow some of the other work that's being done. But we also have to put money into other areas. And so when we're looking and talking about real affordable housing, when we're looking at the resources that schools need, instead of NYPD, they do need guidance counselors. They do need nurses. They do need restorative justice coordinators. And that takes money. Uh, we do need summer youth jobs for our young people. We shouldn't get rid of every single summer youth job that exists. And so that money can be uh, funded into the areas that communities have been structurally starved for so long. Great, right, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, another question that's uh, come in really has to do with the, um, with the city courts. So as you may be aware, um, the uh, Chief Justice, uh, Janet DeFiori, has uh, set up a, uh, the independent review of OCA, you know, the Office of Court Administration. Uh, what role, and this is what's being asked, uh, what role does the public advocate play in reviewing court matters? And uh, what are some things that you think maybe people should be looking at when it comes to issues of institutional racism as it relates to our courts? And most of the courts uh, are state, and uh, the public advocates uh, is primarily, uh, we oversee city agencies. Uh, so to that extent, it's limited. And we just raise issues as they come and really do our best to propose uh, changes. We do a lot more work around housing court and evictions. And of course, uh, we look at the criminal justice system as a whole, uh, which is important to look at, as was mentioned, uh, judges and DAs in particular uh, have a very big sway of what's going on. And everybody knows that the court system uh, is not equitable right now uh, and isn't really as just as, as folks think. And so, we're really trying to reimagine what that looks like and why do we need so many people? Like the response very often to uh, violence in black and brown communities is to lock up as many black and brown people as humanly possible. Uh, and we know that doesn't work, but you know, I've been a big fan of the Red Hook Justice Center uh, and uh, community courts like that. And I think that's more of a way we should be going to. Right. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because, uh, you know, we have one in, uh, in Harlem, but uh, a lot of folks don't seem to be aware of it. Can you let folks know a little bit more about what the uh, community justice centers are? Uh, I didn't know uh, about the one in Harlem, so I'd like to get more information about it. Uh, but it's a lot more uh, community oriented uh, where uh, the judge, it is a, uh, it is a courtroom. Um, the judge has a lot of latitude depending on what the crime is uh, to make it much more community oriented uh, so that there, it is a restorative justice model so that uh, of course you, you can do jail time but why not do uh, time that helps you uh, restore any damage that occurred and actually uh, help you understand uh, what the damage was and uh, how it affected somebody else and grow yourself uh, grow and grow yourself and they also have youth courts that are associated with it where young people can adjudicate things as well. I went to the Red Hook Justice Since, uh, Center. People may or may not know I had an issue with uh, some uh, speed cameras uh, a, few, a few years back. But, um, and I chose uh, to abide by a law that wasn't even a law yet, but you, it recommended that you can lose your license unless you go to this uh, 
program at this community court, which I did. And I have to say it was very uh, eye-opening for me. And it did uh, have me begin to change behavior after I went through it. Great, thank you. Uh, so one other question uh, that's uh, come up, and it has to do with the idea of uh, use of force. You know, it seems sometimes when you look at the term, you know, uh, use of force and what is considered excessive use of force, there's a whole lot of kind of grayness in there. Um, what do you think uh, needs to be done to make sure that there's a little bit more certainty to make sure that, uh, you know, folks who uh, are law enforcement officers who claim that they were using force because it was required, um, you know, there is some, some type of uh, threshold so, you know, people could be able to determine, you know, whether it was objective that someone has used force and whether it hasn't been. Um, you know, I think a lot of it can be said to be subjective, right? But we know, or should know, that certain things are not commensurate with certain crimes and things that are happening. So why are you choking a man to death? Why are you choking a man unconscious? I mean, it's clear. You have your knee on somebody's neck. It's clear that that is an overuse of force. And it doesn't have to be a choke. It could be punching somebody in the face because they don't have a mask on, or throwing them down to the ground. All of these things are clear that it's uh, a, an abusive use of force, an overuse. And what needs to happen is there has to be accountability. For that. And when there's no accountability, those things will continue being Use. And so I'm glad to see the last chokehold video you see of uh, that officer suspended without pay immediately, which is not what happened with Daniel Pantaleo when we had to wait uh, five or six years. Uh, I'm glad to see that there are uh, disciplinary actions occurring uh, to Officer Garcia, who threw that man on the ground on the Lower East Side uh, in trying to effectuate social distancing with the mass. We need to see accountability the same way um, any of us would see accountability uh, if, if something happened and we either did something to an officer or a civilian, there will be repercussions. Too often the problem that we have is that when it's the other way around and there's an officer uh, on a civilian, we don't see those repercussions. And when we start to see it, I also believe we'll start to see uh, changes in behavior. Great. All right. I know we're just uh, kind of coming up on the time, um, but uh, one uh, final question we have is, is there a role for participatory budgeting to play in reallocating resources from policing to protecting and supporting? Yeah, I mean, I was one of the first four, it was four of us who initiated public uh, participatory budgeting in the city council. It's now grown tremendously, uh, which is amazing. I absolutely think there is a role. How we set it up is the question. Uh, it does take a lot of funding and take a lot of infrastructure. Uh, there is a entity that's in charge of participatory budgeting uh, for the city. Uh, so we are looking at how we can institute that as we're doing this. But as you may know, there's a lot of competing things right now uh, with not a lot of resources rapidly coming up on some deadlines. But that is one uh, that is being raised. And uh, I don't know who asked that, but I know Councilman Brad Lander has been uh, very much trying to push that. So maybe he planted somebody uh, uh, here today. Right. Okay. Right. But possibly, possibly. And actually, even as you said that, there's a question I have, uh, even though some of these were from me in the beginning anyway, but uh, you started bringing it up, I guess, as a final thing. Um, you know, one of the things I'm actually worried about is that so much money has actually had to be diverted, you know, rightfully so, um, because of COVID-19. Um, and obviously, there's going to be less tax dollars that may be coming in because of all the businesses that are shut down. You know, how do we make sure that some of the actual um, reforms that may be happening now, you know, are able to continue? Because, I mean, you already see that some of the money, as you're, you know, I think you're, you know, indicating in some way, has been going to other things, right? You know, and people are starting to take money out of things such as education or whatever. How do we make sure that, you know, our communities are okay as we try to get through these, you know, these, um, you know, you know, these recent uh, challenges? Uh, we are in some scary times, and I just want to be um, very honest about that. And I don't know the, if the people know the extent of the times that we're in. Um, I, you know, you just say depression level, economic state. It may actually be worse. We may be in a time that we have not seen before. Uh, I do believe that the city is resilient and will recover, but we just have to be honest and set the scene. And, you know, I say that in conjunction with something else I was talking about, which is... Um, uh, I put a video out today because 
we want to have honest conversations. And sadly, shootings and murders are starting to uptick in this in this um, in this city. And actually, places like Chicago, this is very sad, and we have to be honest about it. But we also have to be honest about the story behind it. And people want to leave the story out of it. Right? But pre-pandemic, we were at historic. Some people say un un um, it, you know unsustainable lows when it comes to crime. And now we went through and going through this global pandemic and people saw, as I mentioned, their neighbors and their friends and their family dying and out of jobs. And then they come out and we're seeing this depression like economic state. And you go through history and you know what happens when these things converge. And that's not an excuse. We can't excuse behavior. But if we're if we're not honest about the story, we may have a dishonest approach. And so what has happened very often is that people believe they send police and the problem is solved. But that's not how this works. And sometimes it causes, a lot of times, it causes additional problems. And so we have to be steadfast about having this conversation. And we have to have leadership that's courageous in pushing the, the conversation forward and understanding that if we have to have layoffs, we're not going to lay everybody off and leave the police intact. <laughs> we're not going to propose, as was proposed, cutting the division of youth and community development by 40% and leave the police department in by all by almost 100%. That's not what we're going to do. We also have to remember though the difficulty because sometimes people, um, even if they're not safer, are content with feeling safe. Uh, and we're gonna have to contend with that because you know, as we see these rises in, in certain crimes, which we have to address, um, even if sending police doesn't make it better, they people are used to feeling better. And it's gonna be difficult as we continue this conversation to let folks understand what we're proposing will actually make you safer. And we have to focus on that because that's the thing that will actually effectuate the change that we want. Great, great. And uh, there's a comment that came in that I guess maybe some of the uh, folks who are in here may be interested in. There's a uh, group called uh, SEQ Legal, a Facebook group where uh, attorneys are working together, I guess, to provide some free resources out there to uh, uh, folks who may need it. So uh, definitely uh, check that out. So with that said, uh, you know, thank you so uh, much, uh, Public Advocate, for spending some time with us. You know, for thank all the you. work that you've been doing. And, uh, you know, of course, I, would, I think it's uh, safe to say on behalf of the uh, Bar Association, any ways that the Metropolitan Black Bar Association can play a role in uh, addressing legal issues in our communities and figuring out ways that we can be helpful in getting through these challenging times, definitely uh, keep us in mind. And again, just uh, keep up the good work and thank you to India, uh, thank you to Jarissa, thank you to Jasmine, thank you to you know, everyone who also is a public advocate's office that played a role in making sure that we can make today happen. Thanks so much, thanks for the invite and thanks for the work that you and all the members do. Peace and blessings, love and light to everybody. That was good, take care. Thank you. Great, so uh, with that said, uh, you know, I just wanna thank everyone for, uh, for tuning in today. Uh, I guess as I was mentioning in the beginning, the um, public advocate had a couple of um, other uh, work issues that were coming up, so we needed to cut it a couple of uh, minutes short. Um, but I believe we're able to get to the large majority, or if not all the questions that were asked, as well as some of them that we had prepared. So thanks again for uh, tuning in for this uh, clearly virtual um, fireside chat. I hope you guys learned something. And uh, you know, let's uh, work together and uh, making sure that we're protecting our communities, uh, investing in one another, and making sure that as the you know attorneys in our community, that you know we're doing what we can to um, uh, work hard together and uh, do some positive work. So thanks to you all, and uh, take care. And oh, and quick shout out because I see something from uh, Tabitha out there. Um, can say a quick hello to uh, Judge uh, George uh, Daniels. Take care. See you, everyone.